My name's Elliot Hulse, and I love smoking weed. I'm in love with Mary Jane. She's my main thing. At least she used to be. Weed, marijuana, the the devil's lettuce. <laughs> yeah, man. Love Mary Jane, but she kills all the good things inside me. Cuts me off from the people I love. Cuts me off from the good Lord above. And so when I had a six-month weed-free streak, I thought I was in the clear. Things were going well. Paid off my debts. Repaired some damage I created. I was getting ready to move out here to my 42-acre cattle ranch here in rural Florida. Far away from any temptation to call the only dude I know that could sell me weed. He'd be miles and miles and miles away. I was totally in the clear. Well, on the way here, I saw a billboard. Billboard. Never seen this billboard before in my life. Brand new billboard with a big green weed leaf on it. I'm thinking, like, there's no way this is not selling weed in Florida. It's, it's illegal here. You can't just buy it. You can't buy it unless you have a medical card. And back then, this was two years ago, if you had a medical card, you couldn't get a firearms carrying license. So I wasn't going to give up my guns for the ganja. <laughs> But underneath it, it said Delta 8, a new legal weed. Oh, man, you could just imagine. You could just imagine what happened next. And just like that, I fell. I fell. My climb to the top started from scratch, brother. And the reason why I tell you this is because if you struggle with any kind of vice, sinful habits, addictions, drinking drugs, jerking off, whatever it is. You're not alone. If be your strongest version of yourself, strength camp, strong man, Elliot Hulse, fell to a plant, <laughs> fell into the use of weed, of all things, right? That's like a slacker's drug, right? And I didn't start using it until I was damn near 35, right? Decided I wanted to slack off after working hard for you know, the past 10, 20 years. If I could fall into it and struggle to get out, uh, don't feel so bad if you're struggling yourself as well. And that's what today's podcast is all about. You know, I'll share a little bit, a bit about, about my ch challenges and struggles, but as well, I'm going to share what you could do about it. I have a method, a system, something I've used that I've also shared with hundreds of men, and it has been very useful in their lives. And so that's what today's podcast is all about. As you can see, the title is The Fall and Rise of Men, How to Be a Strong Man in Hard Times. And that is on a macro level and on a micro level, right? So I started on the micro level because we all, well, what think about ourselves, right? My, most, my favorite topic is myself, and I think most people's are too. Everybody's tuned in to WIIFM. What's in it for me? So, you know, we think about the fall and rise. We think about falling into, you know, whatever it is that you're trying to stay out of. And then rising again and falling again and rising again and hopefully staying in that state of grace where you never fall again. Right? But we're human. So we're talking about the individual. We're talking about you. But we're also talking about the macro. We're talking about men in general. And uh, we're going to dive deep into that as well because as is clearly evident today we are in a fallen time right so how to be a strong man in hard times uh, a lot of people are expecting hard times they're, 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 a lot of people are experiencing hard times the hard times are upon us whether we like it or not so let's talk a little bit about the goal of today's podcast and what you should expect out of the next uh, few hours maybe here with me we'll see and we're going to talk about destroying vice right we talked about that here just in a moment uh, or just now, but we're talking literal vices, right? Drinking, right? If you're a binge drinker, right? I have one client who woke up every morning and poured a glass of whiskey with his eggs, right? That's a, that could be a problem. Uh, drugs, drug use, any kind of drug use, altering your mind, getting out of you know, numbing, numbing yourself, and you know, just getting out of a state of clarity, right? That takes you off your course. Drugs is what it did for me. Uh, caused a lot of problems in my life. I know you got there are people out there that are like, oh, weed is not that bad. 
But these are the people that when you tell them, well, why don't you quit? They, they tell you all the reasons why they can't, all kinds of cope. <laughs> Me, you know, part of the fact that dope was making my life dumb, uh, I wanna be able to have self-mastery. And it was one of the things that I discovered I didn't have self-mastery on. So drugs, jerking off, all right, huge, big one. In my program, the majority of the guys are struggling with some form of lust, you know? And I can't say that maybe I wouldn't also if I wasn't married, right? Um, so that's huge pornography, man. That's probably the biggest one most guys are dealing with or basically any sinful habit or addiction, anything that's keeping you less than what you know you can be that has a grip on you. And that's why we call it a vice, right? It has a grip on you. Uh, we're also going to talk about building strength, both internal and external strength. You know, I'm talking literally, you know, losing weight, having more energy, thinking clearly, but also having vigilance, resolve mental strength, emotional strength, being a strong man, not just a dude that can lift, but a man that overcomes resistance of all kinds. We're gonna talk about leading your wife as a part of this because uh, we know that a part of the fall of a man or men in this day and age has a lot to do with feminism. We're gonna, do, we're gonna dig into that in a moment here, but you know, men are kind of uh, up in arms, not sure what to do about and with women. On one hand, uh, we're, we're, we're chasing women and using their bodies for sensual gratification. And then on the other hand, we're like, but they're whores and I don't want to marry them. Right? So if you're in that stage or if you're where I'm at right now in my life, which is with a wife and we see a lot of marriages falling apart, not working well, the dynamics within the home are just perverted. Like I said, feminism has destroyed that the, the, the simps and the, uh, the F boys that, have emerged from the feminist movement are part of the reason why men just can't lead their homes. Uh, we're going to talk about a feminacy in that regard. Protecting the family. Men are meant to be generative. In fact, that is the top quality of what it means to be a king in, the, in Robert Moore's explanation, King, Warrior, Magician, Lover. He says the king is generative, generative. What does generative mean? To generate, to generate. And how do you generate? With your genitals, right? You make generations with your genitals by generating as men, but we live in a degenerate time, and um, and there's a lot that has to do. There has a lot to had a lot to do with what we spoke about before in terms of feminism, but the family is is really what's being attacked. We got to protect the family. Got to protect your family, embody and demonstrate true masculinity for your children. Get their admir uh, ad admiration. Right? It's, lo it's lovely when your children admire you. Right? How many how many parents can say that? Oh, my children admire me. Wasn't always the case for me. It's the case now. I'm going to show you how, I, how and why. Uh, what else are we going to talk about? Having a greater impact on your business. You know, I'm talking to businessmen here because we have a tremendous responsibility and we can have a tremendous impact on the world if the work that we do is righteous in an alignment, right? Strong men, right? And during, the, during hard times is when strong men really rise and weak men suffer and struggle and sink. And finally, we're gonna talk about the critical importance of being the man that God has called you to be. You know, we live in a time where men are lost. We don't know what to do. What's my mission? What's my vision? And men are mission seeking missiles. Without a mission, a man is nothing, <laughs> right? A woman's mission is essentially given at birth, right? And you know, you might, people might not like to hear that, but it's very clear, you're built for making babies. Men, not so much, not so much. And, and that ambiguity leads to, well, there's a sort of freedom, right? Inherent in being a man in that regard. But freedom also leads to confusion. And if we don't have a clear path, a clear path of atonement, I'm gonna talk about this, I don't wanna get ahead of myself, but it all leads back to God, the road back home. And so we're going to be talking about these things. And I think it's uh, a part of the zeitgeist, I guess you could say, right? Like this is a recent, recently the cyclical nature of the individual life and the grander societal cycles have gained traction in the collective for good reason. Uh, we're headed for hard times. So people start like paying attention to stuff like this. We got the hero's journey, which is the individual's cyclical nature or the cyclical pattern archetype 
that happens in our life. There are seasons in your life. There's, there's, there's no question about it. There's seasons in a man's life. And so I did one of my more popular videos back in like 2013 was about the hero's journey. You know, I was kind of leading the way there in many regards by bringing this up. Now it's sort of a common concept for people to talk about. But, you know, there's a, there comes a time in a man's life when he's called to leave his home, leave what's comfortable, no longer uh, be what he once was, take the call to adventure. And then he goes to a road of trials. Right. We're going to talk about that road of trials. We're going to talk about where you might be. I'm going to give you some context to get an idea of where you might be on that road of trials or that metamorphosis, which is next. There's a, a, ch a change that happens in men as, uh, as you make this journey around the clock, right? And it's spiraling, right? I always, this, is, this was one of my most popular memes in my videos. I would do this, right? I like, oh, so life does this. It doesn't do this. It spirals. Right. And so where you where are you on that spiral? Are you at the, at the end or you're at the beginning? Yeah. Right. So these are all things to consider, uh, given the topic of the conversation today. And then, of course, the masculinity cycle. I don't know if that's exactly what you call it, but it's a it's an archetype. We see it all throughout history. All you got to do is look at the Old Testament in the Bible. And it's like, oh, we're at starts with Adam. Hey, I'm in a garden. Oh, I was kicked out. Hey, things are going good. Oh, no. Hey, we're flourishing. Oh, now we're in prison. Right? And the whole thing, it's just this. Right? So you got to prepare for it. You can't be upset about it, but you got to be aware of it. Right? You need a map. And so today is a lot about the map. Right? Where are we? Big part of what we're going to be talking about today is where are we? You know, for the most part, people don't know. We don't know where we're at. And so we're going to talk about that. So... This pattern that I'm talking about here is not just uh, the human experience, right? For the individual or collective, we see it everywhere in nature. From the grand patterns in nature, the daily rhythms, the celestial rhythms, uh, the grand cosmic patterns, right? If you, if you, if you kind of kept a camera outside and just looked at you're like one tree, like you see at the bottom of the screen there, that tree, it literally looks like the tree's doing this. Like, you know, if it just, if the camera was there for like, you know, five years, it would just do this. Two, three, right? Leaves, it's, it's bubbling, it's dying. It's proliferating, it's degenerating, right? It's generating, it's degenerating, right? It's just, it is what it is. And it's true and it's evident and it's beautiful because it gives us a map. It gives us context to know where we are and what we could do about it. Yeah, uh, you know, if you're if you don't know any better and you see all the tree leaves falling off the trees and all the fruits rotting on the ground, you're gonna be like, oh my god, no, we're all gonna die. Now realizing, hey, dude, chill out. A couple months, it's all gonna come back. Uh, so it goes from those grand cycles, right? Grand cosmic cycles down to the biological patterns that keep us alive. Everything pulsates. Everything pulsates, right? Every breath you take, is just like that tree, is breathing, right? Inhalation, exhalation, right? I know I'm getting kind of rudimentary here. Systole, diastole, right? Everything in life is doing this, right? And that's indicative of the cyclical pattern of things. And I'm fascinated with this because without this knowledge, we become so fixated on certain uh, happenings, right? Like in the news, like what's happening right now in the news, what's happening right now. And everybody gets all uh, attached to it, not realizing, well, dude, it's, it's going to come and it's going to go chill, but there's a resourceful way to go about it. And I can tell you because I know I've been through it. I seen it coming. I called it coming and I watched it as you watched me. And so you've seen this pattern that I'm going to describe so that you have context for your life by using myself as an example. And of course, like I said, my favorite subject is myself, but I'm not sharing this with you because of me. You guys, if you've, if you've been a fan, if you've been watching me, you know, come and go for the past 20 years almost, you know that this is true. People have even done documentaries on like, you know, is this guy schizophrenic or something? I, you know, I think what happens, at least what I speculate is that everybody goes through these changes. I happen to be in a, a, a dramatic dude, right? All right. Like, in other words, I don't, I'm not afraid to change, right? I'll just make dramatic shifts in the moment. It's not always good. Maybe it is a little pathological, but it's 
also on YouTube. <laughs> All I got to do is follow me for the past 12 years or so or 20 years or whatever. And you'll see. I'm actually going to go through them right now. Here's, here's a cycle that you didn't see what the tail end of, right? So 2004 to 2016, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very convinced that these cycles happened in 12 years, at least for the individual. Uh, it's, it's exactly what happened for me. And, I, and in retrospect, I discovered that it was 12 pattern, 12 year patterns, right? When I started experiencing it and then I l learned from someone, oh, this happens every 12 years. And she showed me how. I was like, oh man, I looked back and I was like, yeah, I remember 24 was a very, very tough time for me. And then I also remember even before I was aware of the pattern that why are all these 24 year olds always hitting me up with their problems? It seemed like the 24 year olds always had the biggest problems. And it makes sense to me now. Well, 24, I didn't know my ass from my elbow. I didn't know what I was doing, didn't know where I was going. I just moved to Florida. Let me back up just a moment. We, I just got married. Just had a baby. Well, my wife did, anyway. <laughs> Just moved to Florida. Broke. Deep in credit card debt. I had nothing but a lot of, uh, I had a big smile and a lot of ambition. And I had that, that was going for me. Age 27, a light went off. I discovered Strongman. Most of you guys kind of maybe knew me back then, 2012-ish. Uh, by the time I was 30, that's when most of y'all met me. Good old Yo Elliot on YouTube, right? The seeds that were planted at 24 as a young personal trainer started coming to fruition around 30 as a you know YouTube celebrity. And then by 33, I was entering the last phase of that cycle. And that's when I, luckily, you know, a lot of people like denigrate me. I'm not even gonna get into it, but I started talking about king, being a king, being a king. And it was so poetic because it has a lot to do with coming back to the top of the clock. And I didn't even know what I was, I didn't know about these, this archetype of initiation is what it's called, the cycle. I keep saying cycle, but you're going to learn in a moment that it is an archetype and it's called the archetype of initiation. Um, I discovered from Robert, Robert, Robert Moore, who wrote the book King, Warrior, Magician, Lover that I found around that time, which led me to understanding a lot of what we're going to talk about right now. And the thing, that, the, the little tangent that I was about to go down <laughs> That I stopped myself because yeah, it's just gonna sound like I'm bragging, but I'm just stating facts. It's just been a pattern in my life that I'm the starter. I'm the first guy to do stuff. I'm the pioneer. Doesn't mean that I'm the best guy. Doesn't mean that I'm a guy that's gonna finish the race, but I start it. And so, you know, strong man I made popular. And then King, I made popular. Everybody was denigrating me at the time. Why is that talking about being a king? Now you go on Instagram, everybody's calling everybody else king. <laughs> that's just what it is. But I have no, you know. I, I think it's cool. I watch people, you know, take my spark and turn it into a roaring flame. And so I don't doubt myself anymore. So that was the first cycle, right? Up and down. Didn't know what was going on. Well, I went into this cycle. This was another a division of 12, the age 36, right? So at 33, I was finishing it up. I was at the peak. King Elliot, everybody loved me by 36. I lost my marbles. Didn't know what was going on. I was like, do I really want to be this? Do I really want to keep going down this route? And I started making bad decisions. Like that's when I started smoking weed. I started smoking weed at 36. Who does that? But it was a process that I was called to. And I'm going to tell you what it's called in a moment. I'm going to give you, there's a name for this, right? And it's either a deliberate takedown so that you can metamorphosize or something happens to you. You know, a crisis, but it is a crisis time. Just like age 24 is a crisis time, age 36, generally speaking, this is, the map is not the territory, fellas. Doesn't mean that what I'm saying is exact, but there's a, there's a general, it rhymes, right? <laughs> it rhymes. So you can kind of, you know, see it generally happening. Around 36, is a, there's a crisis, you know? And uh, that's when I started getting weird, grew my hair out, look at that strange ass hairstyle I did, right? And, uh, you know, smoking weed and just looking like a punk. So that was Hippie Elliot going through catabasis. Then I like to say this is the stage of confrontation. So we had crisis, confrontation, right? Move, and this has everything to do in the archetype of initiation with moving away from the world of the mother. I started what maybe many people started calling me misogynist. People call it MAGA misogynist Elliot. There's this kid that made a documentary about me. 
Well, this it was perfectly timed and perfectly executed, and I did it in a very poetic way because that stage, that time is required, confrontation was required for me. Something woke up in me, and I realized the deplorable state that I and most men were in. So as the image demonstrates, I picked up my gun. I picked up my gun and I started firing. Then we move into the integration phase. This was akin to atonement with the father when you're talking the archetype of initiation. And this is when I started praying, you know, uh, I started really taking being a father seriously. You could call this Catholic Elliot, right? And it's kind of who you see I am right now. Obviously we're only in 2023 and you know, I'm just getting started here, right? Uh, when I say just getting started, I mean like everything's coming full circle. And then you could just only imagine if the present is a good indication of the future, what the next uh, quadrant of the cycle is going to look like for me. So what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about the problem that uh, most men face and why this, this, this journey is not navigated in the most resourceful way. Why society calls it, you know, uh, they denigrate it. They say that, you know, you need to man up, toughen up. Well, so the, the part of the problem that we're going to dig deep into. So this is the map, by the way. This is going to be the map. If you're watching this, if you're, if you're listening to the podcast, well, you can, you can get the slides. I'll tell you how to do that later. Or you can just watch me on YouTube. But you're, you're looking at the map here. And so we're going to begin today with the problem. And there are several aspects of the problem of falling into vice as I did and then allowing it to be a drag on your life and on society. And it begins with the predictable pattern of masculine effeminacy. We're going to dig deep into masculine effeminacy. It is, uh, it's like gravity. And if you don't fight against it, you'll be drawn into it. You'll be dragged right down into it. We're going to talk about what effeminacy is and, and how it happens. Uh, we're going to talk about the cultural causes of collapsed masculinity. Uh, it, there's no question that we're under attack by those who know how to facilitate degradation and degeneration, especially at these stages. You know, it's like if some if somebody's falling, right? You you got one of two things that you could do. If you really love that person, you'll grab them and stop them from falling. But if you know they're falling and they're about to fall, and you're not a nice person, you push them. Because all you got to do is just a little finger and he's, and he's over. Well, there, there, are, there are legit enemies that want to see, in particular, Western civilization fall. And so there's a, a I know I sound like a conspiracy theorist, but it, it's not a theory. And it's just, look, I'm going to show you the history. I'm going to give you all the resources. You, know, and you decide for yourself if you want to believe it or not. But uh, it's facts. <laughs> cultural causes. There are cultural causes for the collapse of masculinity. Then we're going to talk about feminism that is a part of that collapsing, but we're going to talk about man's reaction to it, the rise of F boys or Falk boys, if you will, F-A-W-K, <laughs> and simps. And so, of course, the reaction uh, when we're talking about Falk boys and simps is the high road. We're talking about what that means. We're talking about the low road. Both roads are unresourceful. You have men that take the high road and you got men that take the whole low road. And I'm going to teach you the middle road, the solution. And so we're going to talk about traditional masculine initiation that help bolster us against for generations, for thousands of years, perhaps. Elders, fathers, grandfathers, uncles, older men, they understood that effeminacy had to be rooted out. That men, men needed a process, by, or young men, boys, needed a process by which they can become men and they could carry their weight in society. Well, we don't have that anymore today. It seems that since the uh, Industrial Revolution and fathers were taken from the home, prior to that we were agrarian, and uh, fathers and, and you know, children were homeschooled and like everybody was at home on the ranch, like I have with my family now. Right. So that the father was there. The fathers were there to watch the boy and keep an eye on him. And the mothers, too, were aware that, you know, there's going to come a point when this boy's going to be too big for his britches and his daddy's going to have to show him. Traditional masculine initiation, a rite of passage that is ever present, has always been there, 
and it's cross-cultural. No matter what culture anthropologists studied, it was some form of traditional masculine initiation. And then we're going to talk about the Christian path, the mystical Christian path of holiness. Guaranteed. Now, if you're a Christian, you probably, you, I'm pretty sure you never heard of this, right? Most Christians, unless you're a traditional Christian, most Christians don't know that there's a deep mystical tradition that is highly supportive for this journey. Includes a lot of prayer and a lot of fasting. You'll see in a moment. Um, and there are those that are uh, are antithesis to it. Or, and then there are those who are not Christian. And I, I get it. Not everybody here is Christian. Um, listen, though. Listen. Because you might change your mind when you discover what the mystical Christian tradition of the ancient church. You know, these are old traditions that are lost to modernism and a whole bunch of other junk. So we're going to be talking about that as well. Now, before I continue, this is obviously, uh, you know, I, I, I spent a lot of time putting this together. Uh, it's, a, it's pieced together from a lot of my previous talks, particularly at the 21 convention, Make Man Strong Again, you know, the rights of initiation, stuff like that. Um, but I put it all together here because I wanted to make one signature strategy, high concept YouTube video podcast for you guys to understand the deeper the deeper ideas behind some of the crazy things you hear me saying a lot of what I share I say you know they're in like these short form clips and stuff or like you know just clips from YouTube from my uh, Q&A classes like they're out of context and people are like what the hell is Elliot talking about and I you know I and I run the risk of sounding shallow and not to brag, I'm anything but shallow. I might actually go a little too deep sometimes, and then that pisses people off. But, you know, I can't live my life for other people. If it's shallow, it's only because I didn't explain. And if it's too deep, it's because you need to pay attention a little bit more. So th being that I had put this together, I have s slides, and I have notes, and I have resources. If you're really digging the stuff that I'm talking about and you want to go a little bit deeper, you can get a content upgrade, I'm calling it or you can get my slides, my notes, my resources, just go to elliothalls.com slash notes, or use the link in description. You, or all you gotta do is put your email in there, and I'm gonna give you all this stuff here so that you can study it on your own and do what you want with it. Okay, so, uh, you know, let's dive into the problems. As if we're not already aware, I did take some of these statistics from a newscast by this gentleman, Tucker Carlson, a couple years ago, with just some astonishing uh, statistics and data that it makes it very evident that something's going on with men uh, and it's very nefarious and if you ever get a chance to just go on YouTube and look up this series uh, it's very convincing that there seems to be a coordinated attack of some sort on masculinity I know that there are those that are like oh you men shouldn't complain or you know our men have always been in charge now it's time for women but you don't understand, this is a perversion, what we're experiencing. This isn't normal, right? And so some of the statistics that he shares, let's see. Uh, suicide rate. Tell me what, what is normal about suicide and why we should just accept it, right? Men account for 72%. Oh, I don't have that on here. Well, a heck of a lot of suicides. Most men that kill themselves, most people that kill themselves are men. And, and that... That, that rate is going up every year, especially since COVID. Addiction, here we go. About uh, Men account for about 72% of alcohol-related deaths annually. 72%. Close to 68,000 men die from alcohol use and abuse every year. 68,000. That's a lot. Prison. More young men today are behind bars than ever before in the history of the United States. Men comprise more than 93% of the prison population. That's not normal. It shouldn't be the case. Crime, men account for about 80% of arrests for violent crime and 63% of arrests for petty crime. It's because these are men that don't have a mission and a vision and they have no guidance in this world. Uh, close to three, obesity, close to three quarters of men are either overweight or obese in this country and about 50% of all men are now unable to pass the Army's basic recruitment test 
required to enlist in basic training. 80% of men or 50% of men will, cannot pass basic training. I'm listening to a book called Gates of Fire, me and my son, and uh, it's about Spartan culture. From the time a boy pops out the womb, they're training him up and getting him ready to be physically fit. And I'm not saying we need to be a Spartan culture, but when you look at the history, Western civilization, men were always expected to be fit and well prepared for battle. 50% of us can't even do a damn pull up. Probably more can't do a single damn pull up, right? Let's keep going. Uh, financial, you know, men are, in, 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 they're not, we're not what we once were. Men have always been the breadwinner of the family, the traditional family. This is no longer the case. From 1979 to, 19, to, to 2019, the average American woman saw her real wages increase by 28.8%. Men saw their real wages fall by 3% over the same time period. This idea of the wage gap is a fallacy. We all know that. So family, divorce rates are as high as 60% in some American cities. And of that, 90% of divorces are filed by women. What's up? The fact is that men lose the majority of divorce and custody court cases, which leads to fatherlessness. And we know that children from fatherless homes fall behind in every category. Both young men and women suffer from fatherlessness, suffer as a result of it. And, you know, uh, by extension, men are godless, right? Today, men are godless. And by extension, we're fatherless ourselves, right? There's no God the Father. There's no pattern. There's no archetype. There's no divine guidance, right? Men have abandoned religion in the West, it's a shame. And as you'll see, the effects of this have been devastating. But I do see a sort of comeback, and that makes me have promise for the future. So let's get into some of the nitty gritty of what's going on here. We'll begin with the predictable pattern of masculine effeminacy. And so we got to define the word effeminate right away because we're not saying it's not feminine. You know, a lot of people are like, oh, and now you're, you're bashing women. No, I'm not saying anything about women. Effeminacy is a trait that's found in men. And it's not being a woman, it's an unwillingness, according to St. Thomas Aquinas, that's how it's defined, effeminacy or what in his Latin, his Latin or Latin or, or Italian, morbizia, all right? So if, if you read the Summa or I guess, I don't know, any of his writings, he would say morbizia, which translates to softness, which we translate as effeminacy. It's sort of a, it's a masculine softness, a soft man, a weak man. And it's specifically an unwillingness to put aside one's pleasure in order to pursue what is arduous or difficult, right? In other words, an unwillingness to do what's right because of what feels good. And we know we live in a culture that just worships good feelings. And that's where men are. If it don't feel good, I ain't going to do it, right? And it, what he says is that it's, it's a disordered attachment to this pleasure, we're going to talk in a moment about whether or not you have a disordered attachment to pleasure, but it's very evident, you know, the drinking drugs, the jerking off, right? Think about even your cell phone that we get a, we get a dopamine hit. There's a pleasure associated with playing with your damn cell phone. You ever leave your cell phone at home? You don't you feel like a drug addict without his drugs, right? So there's a lot of effeminacy. There's, a, there's intellectual effeminacy. I don't think I go into this, the types of effeminacy, but there's volitional effeminacy. There's intellectual effeminacy. Of course, there's sensual effeminacy. All kinds of effeminacy. These are attachments. And they're deep-rooted in our nature as a result of the fall. I may or may not get into this in this talk. So the predictable pattern of, of, of male effeminacy is, is well summed up. You know, it, it's it's mad, it, because men lead, right? So where where men go, society goes. And so if you're looking at society and you're blaming women, women, you, you got it all wrong, dude. That you're part of the feminist plot to point to give women that kind of responsibility. They don't have it. That's not their responsibility, right? They're followers. And even though they think they're leading, <laughs> they're only following the the leaders that are telling them that they should be leaders. They're not actually ever really leaders because the guys that are telling them what to do are guys, right? Feminism was made by men. So great, a great line here, a couple paragraphs. I'm going to do some reading, but really well 
worth listening to is from historian Will Durant. The short version of it is a nation is born stoic and dies Epicurean. And if you know anything about those two contrasting philosophies, you know, stoic is to be strong. Epicurean is to be effeminate, you know, chase your feelings. uh, Epicurean was all about, well, do what feels good. So let me uh, expand on the on the long version of it and follow along with me because you might see yourself. We might see us in this. And he also gives, you know, so it gives you context for what would help us. Will Durant, a nation is born stoic and dies Epicurean. At its cradle, religion stands and philosophy accompanies it to its grave. In the beginning of all cultures, a strong religious faith conceals and softens the nature of things and gives men courage to bear pain and hardship patiently. At every step, the gods are with them and will not let them perish until they do. And even then, a firm faith will explain that the sins of the people was what turned the gods to an avenging wrath. Evil does not destroy faith, but actually strengthens it. But if victory comes, if war is forgotten in security and peace, then wealth grows. The life of the body gives way in the dominant classes to the life of the senses and the mind. Toil and suffering are replaced by pleasure and ease. Science weakens faith even while thought and comfort weaken virility and fortitude. At last, men begin to doubt the gods. They mourn the tragedy of knowledge and seek refuge in every passing delight. Achilles at the beginning, Epicurus at the end. After David comes Job, and after Job, Ecclesiastes. Amazing. And so we see this pattern evident in the rise and fall of Rome. We see it very evident here in the rise and fall of the American empire, right? We got George Washington and now we got Simpson sluts. This is also from the beginning, right? So, you know, we could talk about uh, Rome and America falling, but like it happened in the garden. It's a warning, you know, whether or not you want to read the, the stories in the Bible as literal or not. The bottom line is they also have a moral story. And the moral of the story here is men are in grace, men fall out of grace. And so as was with Adam, things were going well. He had dominion over all things. And then he listened to his wife. He took her fruit. Think about, think about, (laughs) think about F boys and simps taking her fruit. She wants me to have her fruit. You go take her fruit and you get kicked out of the garden. And a lot of men, you know, after living promiscuous lives or, you know, playing with themselves on pornography sites, uh, you're kicked out of the garden, buddy. It hits you. Eventually hits you. And so we see this cycle all throughout. And there's just an interesting thing I noticed when I started studying this is that when the tits come out, that's when shit goes down. And so, of course, you know, Adam and Eve, well, her tits came out, but after they fell, she covered them up. We look at Rome. They fell into all kinds of sexual debauchery, right? Orgies and stuff. Now, coming to recent times, you know, a lot of what we're experiencing here was was prefigured by the French Revolution, which, you know, some people think is a good thing, but really was just a, a revolt against cross and crown, which means a revolt against order. And what do you see every time? This Lady Liberty with her tits out. And of course, today you can't go to a, you know, a rally or whatever without women taking their bras off. They started burning them in the, in the 60s and all that. So you, it's like kind of a signpost, you know, when, when things are good, women are modest. When they start getting bad, that's when the tits come out, shit goes down. And so just a warning, just keep your eyes off the tits. You want to be a good man. So... Let's talk about the, the next uh, aspect of the problem here, right? And I spend a lot of time on the problem in this particular podcast, but um, I'm also going to be talking about the solution, and I'm going to go very deep into these solutions. Uh, it's really become a, uh, an area of mastery for me or um, a domain of mastery, so I'll be talking about them. But bear with me 
while I share the cultural causes of collapsed masculinity. So according to Soviet KGB defector Yuri Bezmenov, this is a video on YouTube that went uh, pretty viral uh, around 2020, Western culture has been under the subject of communist propaganda and disinformation, and what he calls active measures since at least the 1950s. And we're gonna talk about what that actually looks like, but in an interview in 1983, uh, that you can find online, he states that the ideological subversion, just think about that word, ideological subversion, that means I'm going to subvert your ideas. I'm going to, I'm going to brainwash you. It's just, a, it's just a fancy way of saying brainwashing. The ideological subversion or psychological warfare has changed the perception of every American to such an extent that despite the abundance of information, right, no one's able to come to sensible conclusions in the interest of defending themselves, their families, their communities, and their country. It's a great brainwashing process, which goes very slow. And if you just back up for a moment and you think about that, you know, the perception of reality of every American to such an extent that despite the abundance of information, and that's what drives me nuts about certain people. Like, I guess because there's so much fake news, but it's like, you know, like the whole thing with the pandemic. I'm like, bro, there's, there's, I don't even know where to begin, but like there's, how do you believe this stuff? There's too much information. If you just open your eyes, but... It's propaganda, ideological subversion, psychological warfare. I know some of the smartest people, like kids I grew up with that were like high IQ kids, they fall for this shit. They're the ones that fall for it the most. It seems the smarter you are, the deeper you're under this psychological warfare and, and ideological subversion. I'm a C student and I could see right through this stuff. Maybe that's what the C means, you could see. But the A students, they couldn't see a damn thing, right? They could, And they cannot defend themselves. He talks about making sense of Conclusions in the interest of defending yourselves. Men can't defend themselves against women, right? <laughs> it's, and then just think about defending their families. There's a guy that, that uh, I met at the 21 convention that I spoke at a couple of years ago. His, you know, his wife ran off with one of his kids and is cutting his son's dick off and giving him home warrants. And I think this, the courts couldn't even help him, right? Think about the brainwashing that that whole thing is all about right? It's a great brainwashing process. He says it goes very slowly. So you could just only imagine this started from the 1950s, almost hundred years ago. <laughs> Where are we at now? So the foundation for this plan to demoralize Western civilization or culture can be found in the work of two Marxist theorists. You got George Lucas on the bottom of Hungary. And you got Antonio Gramsci, of Italy. These men are credited with being the fathers of w the Western version of Marxism, right? You know, I'm not going to go all into the Bolshevik revolution and what that was all about, but this stuff started unfolding in Russia first, Eastern Europe. And uh, they recognized that they couldn't unfold it westward because in the West, there was no class warfare because there was a growing middle class. And so anyway, they both target, they both taught that communism was impossible in the West until both Western civilization and Christianity was destroyed. Now, why do you think that they would link Christianity with Western civilization? Most people don't realize that all of the fruits, all the amazing fruits of Western civilization are born out of Christendom. And so they understood, right? And if Christianity didn't have the power that it had to, to, to make righteous men's lives, then why would these men think that they need to attack it. So he said they needed to take down both Western civilization, civilizational structures, which is called patriarchy, and its root, which is Christianity, or the Christendom, or Christendom. So according to George Lucas, the guy at the top, the great obstacle to the creation of a Marxist regime was Western civilization itself. As he's quoted for saying, I see the revolution and destruction of society as the only solution. A worldwide overturning of values cannot take place without annihilation of the old values and the creation of new ones. Today we call these people progressives. They call that progress. Uh, that was George Lucas, the guy on the bottom. Antonio Gramsci, the other creator of cultural Marxism, argued that the West would have to be de-Christianized by means of what he entitled the long march to the institutions 
And what he meant by this was that the culture was the new battleground and that all barriers to the acceptance of Marxism must be removed or reconfigured according to Marxist principles. All barriers to acceptance of Marxism should be reconfigured starting with the family by perverting gender roles and by removing the rule of the father, going through the churches, the government, military, Hollywood, sports, entertainment, schools, universities, seminaries, books, advertising, magazines, science, newspapers, and so on. So George Lukacs, he played an instrumental role in the founding of the Frankfurt School in Germany. The school was founded in 1923 with a primary goal of translating Marxism from economic terms to cultural terms. Then for some reason, only you can guess, he was forced to flee from Germany around that time. And so the school reestablished itself in New York City at which point they shifted their focus from destroying traditional Western civilization or culture in Germany to destroying it in the United States, where they kept their focus on the cultural revolution. In institutions of so-called higher education, cultural Marxism was more commonly known as multiculturalism or more loosely known as political correctness. Some of the explicitly stated aims of their programs were to empty the churches, declare women to be an oppressed class and men as oppressors. So this was a part of ideological subversion. It's not true. Uh, they wanted to abolish the difference in education of boys and girls. They wanted to teach sex and homosexuality to children. Look at where we're at. They wanted to create dependency on the state and the state benefits. They wanted to control and dumb down the media. They wanted to promote excessive drinking and encourage the breakdown of the family. Now, given the focus of this podcast is the degradation or the degeneration of masculinity, we'll take special note of their plan to encourage the breakdown of the family since fatherless boys are extremely affected by the degenerate culture. And there's no doubt that the breakdown of the family and fatherlessness contributes greatly to the weakening of men for over the past 60 years or so. Illegitimacy, divorce, single mothers, and male incarceration rates have skyrocketed, as I've shown you earlier, over the first 60 years of the cultural slash sexual revolution. Which brings us to number three, feminism, F-boys, and simps. Let's start with feminism. According to Bob Lewis, the author of The Feminist Lie, at its most basic level, feminism began as a rebellion against marriage and family values. Early feminists believed that once married, a woman's identity disappeared. To gain sympathy, many early feminists ref uh, reframed the institution of marriage as a form of slavery. And to support their view, they pointed out that women didn't have as many rights that men have in society. Well, while on the surface this appears to be a legitimate complaint, upon closer inspection, it completely falls apart. Now, if you weren't sure about the true intention of feminism, here are a few quotes from feminist activists themselves. The complete destruction of traditional marriage and the nuclear family is the revolutionary or utopian goal of feminism. Kate Millett. The nuclear family must be destroyed. Whatever its ultimate meaning, the breakup of families now is an objectively rev revolutionary process. Linda Gordon. How will the family unit be destroyed? The demand alone will throw the whole ideology of the family into question so that women can become, begin establishing a community of work with each other and we can fight collectively. Women will feel freer to leave their husbands and become economically independent either through a job or welfare. Roxanne Dunbar. Unless we give these women too much credit, remember, these women didn't come up with these ideas themselves, nor the means to achieve them. In 1884, Frederick Engels, Karl Marx's closest confidant and colleague, 
published a book that stands at the root of the attack on masculinity, the family, and the rise of feminism. In The Origin of the Family, Private Property, and the State, Engels theorized that marriage is not a means to extend love, family, and tradition into the world. Instead, marriage was a means to control women and to extend economic principles and an oppressive economic system. So as a means to overturn the order of the family and marriage within society, Engels made a list of eight specific goals to work towards in order to liberate women. Number one, for women to work on an equal basis with men in factories, right? Why would they want to do that anyway? Number two, to make divorce free and easy. Number three, to remove the specific gendered roles of men and women in society. I'm pretty sure they succeeded. Number four, to destroy the role of housekeeper for women. Number five, to make childcare communalized. Number six, to remove the stigma of illegitimacy in society. In the past, they didn't even say illegitimate. They said bastard. <laughs> you can't say that anymore because most of us are bastards. But they remove the illeg This is what Marxists do. They change the term so it sounds like something that is not. Number seven, for sexual activity to be unrestrained. And number eight, to recreate the definition of family and to make it more flexible. The F-boy and the simp, and both of these types of men are reactionary. They're both reactions to feminism. And so both of these kind of guys, whether the promiscuous F-boy or the simp that wishing, wishes he was, they both serve the agenda of Engels, of Marx, of feminism, and they fuel the downfall of Western society. These men are a scourge onto our society. And their poison and what they're destroying us with is unchecked lust. It leads to broken families, divorce, and daycare society. And it's a wrecking ball to what God has built. Too many of these so-called masculine influencers out there are a part of the problem. They point the finger at women, you know, calling them loose or whores or sluts or all kinds of names. Yet they're quick to jump from bed to bed for empty thrills. These men are hypocrites. And so this behavior also mirrors homosexual lifestyle, right? Sterile transient sex was the plan of homos. They right? wanted to have, put their dicks in holes and have fun. Well, when you have sterile transient sex, even if it's with a woman, you're, you're behaving like a homo. So it's all degenerate, and it's all reactionary, and it's a part of the crumbling culture. It adds death, and it's not life-giving. So here's the crossroads, the linchpin. Will we be the agents of death or the bringers of life, right? The real war isn't about women, guys. It's about where men choose to put their manhood. Will we father sons who will cherish life or will we walk the road of ruin? The future is really in our hands. So let's dig a little bit deeper into both of these reactionary types. So according to Robert Bly in his book, Iron John, you have the high flyer is the first kind of man. And so the high flyer says, let the world burn, get yours while you can. His motto is YOLO. He says, if I can make more money, get more power and have more fun, I will be successful. He says, it's natural for men to have unlimited sex with unlimited options. The problem is that his future is limited. He has no hope. No progeny. A lot of these guys castrate themselves. The, at some point, it all just is meaningless. I've spoken with so many men. I've realized that just after spending years of chasing women, eventually their life ends up meaningless. They gain material pleasure at the expense of spiritual death. And of course, it contributes to communism, feminism, fatherlessness, and degeneracy. You don't want to be a high flyer. The simp is what he would call the low roader, right? This is the depressive type. He says it's not fair. Women are whores, but he thinks he deserves sex too. So he's in conflict. Either women are whores or I deserve sex. I don't know which one. He says, if I can't get what I want, then I'll make others suffer too. So you got guys like, you know, Elliot Rogers from, you know, 10 years ago, this kid who late went on a killing rampage because girls wouldn't give him sex, right? He will, he will just give up. He'll say, oh, well, what's the use? At least I have porn. So these guys are usually just pacified. 
Ultimately, his anger and depression is self-perpetuated. He gets stuck into a mood. That's why he's the depressive type. Outwardly, he seems meek, right? Like a nice guy, but inwardly, he's seething. And as Robert Moore describes in King Word Magician Lover, uh, wherever there's a weakling, if you scratch him, he becomes a tyrant. It's, they're two sides of the same coin. So if you're acting you know, real weak and white knightish, right? Underneath, you're actually just a really angry man. This guy will often contribute nothing to society, to no one. Oftentimes he's lazy. He's the guy that, you know, eats Cheetos in his mama's basement while tapping on the, on the computer keys, being a keyboard warrior. And low key, this guy is a supervillain. Now, often both of these types are found in the same man. And you might go through cycles of this, like a manic depressive, <laughs> kind of like me. And so I know the high flyer road. I've been there before and I know the low road, the depressive road. And according to Alexander Lowen, there's often a swinging between both of these poles or the highs and lows. I'm going to read uh, real briefly from Depression in the Body here in chapter two. He says, since the depressive reaction is what brings a person into therapy and is his main complaint, we tend to overlook the fact that it's generally part of a cycle that consists of a high and a low. So a lot of the guys that were high, you know, they end up becoming low, right? And it's just, it'll, it'll do that. In most cases, the depressive reaction is preceded by a period of elation, the collapse of which plunges the individual into a depression, if we're to comprehend fully the depressive reaction, we must also understand the phenomenon of elation, right? That's why I tell my students, don't get too high because the low is going to be that low. That's one of the things that, you know, guys are getting, like things are happening great and exciting and their life is taking off. I say, that's good. Be detached. Just like if you were depressed, I say be detached. Because if you get too high, well, as Lowen says... He says the signs of elation are not too difficult to discern. The elated person is hyperactive. His speech is more rapid. His ideas seem to flow freely and his self-esteem is conspicuous. Further development of this phenomenon leads to the condition of mania. Psychoanalysis have long concerned with the problem of mania and depression. So anyway, the point is you can swing between both of these. Right. If you're flying real high, brother, I tell you to bring it down a little bit. If you're running too low, I say, hey, pick it up a little bit, brother. And so, you know, I put pictures of myself here because, you know, at some point I let success get to my head. You know, I'm a fallen man. I have my problems. I let my ego just balloon out of control. You can see that up top. Right. Then there was the depressive state. Before I knew it, you know, I was retreating, smoking weed like a like I was going out of style. I was hiding in my office, doing drugs, doing yoga and trying to find myself again. Right. It sounds like a depressed guy. So I have to bring up, you know, th the fact that there's a stage that most men, all men go through, although our society doesn't acknowledge it. And so I didn't know what was really going on when, I, when things started to at age 36 and things started going dark again. And, uh, and I bring this up for you because if you happen to be going through a catabasis, which is the term used in Iron John, which is a Greek word for going down, right? It's going down. You can go onto my YouTube channel and you see where it says KI16. You can go on my YouTube channel or my Strength Camp YouTube channel and look up or just go Elliot Hulse Catabasis and I have a whole video series of what I was doing while I was going through this catabasis because I knew what it was. I knew I was in it and I knew these videos would come in handy someday. They're very creepy as you could see just from the thumbnail there. They're, they're, they're creepy and they're dark, and I think you'll enjoy them. I'll, I'll be sure to link them in the resource uh, page. So, you know, I, I didn't know what was going on until I read Iron John and learned about catabasis is going down process. That is a normal cry for initiation that most men will inevitably experience, but if it's not contained or, or contextualized, it can cause great pain. And so I lost a lot as a result. You know, I didn't have containment because there was no elder, you know, to guide me or to show me or even tell me that this is normal. And there's no context for it because no one ever told me about catabasis and that these cycles are natural and that there's a way to go about it. So you know, I lost hundreds of thousands of dollars 
in ad revenue because I quit making YouTube videos and creating products. I lost sponsorship deals. You know, companies just didn't want to deal with me anymore. I was getting too weird. Partnerships I made and broke many different partnerships at, at that time in particular. Uh, and the goodwill, you know, all the people that were following me on YouTube, they're like, what the hell's going on with this guy? And then I disappeared. I just went dark, gone for a long time. And so that was outwardly, inwardly, my incredible wife, she was suffering during this time. And I was just, I was being the shadow of the man that she married. I, I, maybe if I had somebody that was guiding me along the way and showing me what this is and how to get through it and then preparing my family for what I'm about to, the, you know, the cocoon I'm about to go in for the butterfly is about to come out, maybe it would have been better, but you know, it really it disappointed me, it hurt me when, when, when my, my wife started to show me how I was letting her down and our four children. Now, I don't have a nagging wife, but her silence was enough for me to know she's, she's not a happy woman right now. And the real curveball was my father-in-law, her father. He grew terribly ill, and the night before he passed, I had a dream. And maybe it was a, a voice, I don't know, but I could hear it audibly in the night while I was sleeping. It said, Elliot, you are about to make Colleen's life a living hell and you're about to lose it all. And that shook me to my core. I woke up and the next day her father was, was dead. And I was like, that was, a, that was obviously a sign. And I knew it was a time for me to change. I needed to get my business back on track and win back the respect of my wife. And in order to do that, I needed to quit smoking weed, right? And begin acting like the husband and the father that God called me to be and that my family needed. And even though I tried to quit weed and get serious about business in the past, I would always fail, you know, it's a slippery slope. And so this constant trying and failing caused me to lose confidence in myself and the trust of my loved ones. And I also knew that time was running out, right? My kids were getting older, my wife deserved better. And if things didn't change now, I could lose everything, literally, like the dream said including the last shred of dignity that I even had in myself. And so after that experience of the crazy dream and then Colleen's father passing away the next day, I went on an adventure to discover what was the root cause of this effeminacy. Why am I behaving this way? And why are so many men struggling with so much of the same stuff, right? Uh, as I indicated earlier, I'm not alone. I know I'm not alone. And so I wanted to find out what was really going on. And so in my studies, I learned about the work of Robert Moore, Robert Bly, and various researchers who studied the practice or the lost practice of traditional masculine initiation. I discovered it was a thing. And I realized, you know, after studying their work, that I was a deeply uninitiated man. And if you study, you know, what that means, you, you, you're, it's, it's being wrought with effeminacy. I was deeply unspiritual, even though I was smoking weed and acting like a hippie. And I was still boy-like in my attachments to vice and the absence of mature masculine virtue. Here I am with millions of men following me and I, I couldn't show my face because I know I was acting like a bitch. And so I know I needed to undergo the type of transformative experience suggested and offered by these lost but time-tested practices. So I tried to create a way to do this for myself. Now, the first thing that you need to know about the archetype of initiation or the pattern of initiation is that cross-culturally it follows the same pattern and it's it's a movement from one state of being to the other and the way it's explained in the book because it is explained this way uh, and and demonstrated this way in all forms of masculine initiation there is always a clean break or a movement away from the world of the mother Right. And so it, it means your literal mother. Right. And so, you know, the fathers, the grandfathers, the elders, the, the men of the society, when they knew it was time for a boy to uh, be atoned with the father, which is the second part. But there is no atonement with the father until there's a movement away from the world of the mother. And Iron John, he describes a very dramatic scene where the, 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 the fathers burst into the house or the hut wearing masks and pull the boy away from his mother and take him out to the woods somewhere to initiate him. <laughs> And the great thing about traditional society is that women were privy to what was going on too. If that happened to, you know, I try to explain that to my wife or like my mother, my dad tried to explain it to my mother or, you know, any, any, you know, family today, they'd be like, whoa, 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 wait, what are you talking about? What are you doing? What are you going to do my boy? No, you can't do that. Right. Because we live in a mommy centric culture, but in a culture where fathers rule or patriarchy, the women understand, oh, you know, the dads are doing what's best for the boy. 
And so it wasn't just, you know, the, the big bad dads were coming to take the boy and, and beat, him, beat him senseless until he becomes a man. The whole society was involved in it. The mother was heavily involved with it. She knew, okay, today's the day. They're going to come and get him, right? So it was, it was a literal movement away from the world of the mother. You needed that separation from mommy, as all men do at some point. You can't live your life under your mom's apron strings, right? But it's also figurative. It's literal and it's figurative. In the world of the mother... The word mother, mother comes from the word matter, if you will. What is material or matrix, right? Material, matter, mother, mater, mater. Like when they say like uh, alma mater, right? That's the mother, mater. Matrix, material world. It also is internal, right? We have a, a feeling body that is emotional and that is a very material a sensual gratification, right? Any types of attachments. Effeminacy, as I described before, darkness, chaos, right? Childishness, boy likeness. These are all associated with the world of the mother. Drinking, drugs, jerking off, vice. All these disordered attachments, all these sinful habits. These are all things that when the boy is moved from the world of the mother, he leaves behind. And it has to be. Like he says, a clean break, right? In our society, there is no clean break, right? I try to make a clean break from smoking weed and all of a sudden they made legal weed, right? Like where, where can we go to get a clean break from these things? You want to get a clean break from your cell phone because you're addicted to it? How you get that clean break? Nobody's going to support you in that clean break. They'll look at you and laugh at you. It's difficult when we don't live in a world that honors masculinity and in particular, the process of traditional masculine initiation. So that's the first part. There's always this movement away from the world of the mother and then what they would call atonement with the father, atonement with the world of the father. And so the word father means pattern. Pattern is where we get the word archetype. Archetype is like a spirit. It's a type of spirit. Pattern is spirit. In other words, if you look at a, a, a pattern, a blueprint, right? It's not the thing. It's the pattern of the thing, it's the spirit of the thing, right? A blueprint is the spirit of the building, right? It's the building before the building. And so we got to get in touch with not just our essence, which is our dad, which, you know, they, if you ever heard like a man, when he blows his load, that's his essence, right? A man's seed is his essence. You, so there is an atonement with the worldly father that's associated with it. Because if you don't know your father, if you are not atoned with your father, if you don't have resourceful, relationship and feeling towards your father you're not gonna, you're not going to have a resourceful relationship with yourself there's going to be a part of yourself that you reject so men that hate their dads and men that hate authority are men that hate that aspect of themselves you can't hate something out there but love it in here so you can't hate your father but love the father in you you can't hate authority and then be an authority yourself you got to forgive that father cuz i get it we live in a world with a lot of bad dads fathers that are, are absent but as you know marx pointed out and the how the marxists unfolded this whole plot to destroy the family if you were face the if you were face the father you face the father the father in the home is god the father so god the father in the home represents god the father so it's an atonement with your earthly father and the father above the spirit world rational so going on with my slide rational stoicism right being cool being rational it's associated with liberation, freedom, right? When you are free in Christ, you have no worries. You're not freaking out. You're not ha be, having emotional outbursts, right? You're not whining and crying, right? Because of that atonement with the Father through Christ, as Christians understand it. This comes from pagan uh, roots as well, because it's, it's, it's an archetype. It's in, it's in us. It doesn't matter what your religion is. We all do this or did it. I'm making it come back. Masculinity, light, order, as opposed to the to the chaos of boyhood, boyishness, we're talking order and masculinity. So with this pattern, I think most guys totally understand the, the, the movement away from the world of the mother. And it's important because n nothing happens in the spirit. Nothing happens with the father if there's no movement away from the world of the mother. It's very uh, carnal. It's very material. It's very obvious. I know what I need to do. I need to cut out these bad habits. But the missing link here, especially if, if you're listening to me and you're trying to understand this atonement with the father thing, 
is that there's no context for it in our society. What does that even look like? We have no cohesive understanding an agreement about spirit, about meaning, about the Father, about God, about religion. We're all over the place. So as a result, there's no cultural resource. I knew of no cultural resource. I don't know where to turn to in our anti-father society. Now, besides coming closer to my earthly father, which was such a blessing in my life. In fact, my dad just rolled up here. I just saw him pulling in his car. Love my dad. I felt lacking and unsure about what else I was supposed to do. Right? I know that wasn't the end all. Our ancestors never, it didn't stop there. If you ever watched that movie, at least I watched the cartoon version of The Lion King when I was a kid. Uh, the, the, the lion boy, Simba, when he loses himself, he doesn't know who he is. And the old initiator, the monkey, comes and says, you don't know who you are. And takes him up to the mountain and points to the sky. And then in the sky, he sees, there's your father. And there's your father's father. And there are all the ancestors, all the patterns, all the paternity from which you come from. That's where men look. Men must look up. That's where our pattern emerges from. It's spirit. But, uh, you know, this all sounds crazy. So, like I said, the first half, we understand. The second half, it didn't exist. And I discovered that it is critical because even through my willpower, as much willpower as I use to try to be free from the matrix, the matter, I would often fall and fall and fall again. So I had to figure out this aspect of the father. I also recognized that there were four requirements that are, that are associated with the safe passage of initiation. You know, I was doing it for myself, and so I had to figure it out myself. And so I created a process, which is number one. Luckily, I was in a, a space where I could have sacred space because I had created so much momentum with my business, I could take some time off from work, which is what I did. And a lot of people, they don't have that. But you need a process, you need space, you need an elder. And I, no, I couldn't find an elder. I had men that I made my elders. They didn't know that they were being my elders. And as a result, you know, they couldn't fully guide me and support me in this passage. But I'm happy that they were there but didn't have an actual ritual elder, a man who was carrying me through this process. And Robert Moore asserts that it's critical to also have, number four, communitas. And communitas is more than community, it's a spirit of community. Like I said before, the moms know what's going on. So when the boy comes back to the society, they would even give him a new name. Like oh, the moms would pretend like, oh, I don't even recognize you, who's this man, right? And like you, the other, the men who've been through it or the other boys who are gonna go through it, like everybody's excited for you. You've been through the initiation. You're a brand new man. You walk different. You know, the man will talk different. He literally is transformed through the process. And the, the, the acknowledgement of that transformation can only happen through other people. You go through an initiation. I go through, I went through my initiation. I put myself through this initiation. And as you can see, I've been studying this stuff and working with this stuff for the longest time, hiring people to, to, to learn with. I show up on YouTube and people are like, who's this guy? What are you talking about this time? He's the same old dummy, right? They have no idea. So there's no mirroring. Communitas is mirroring. It's a community. It's people, other men that know, hey, I've been there. I've been through it. I'm a new man, and so are you. It's critical. I didn't have that. Not complaining, but it just meant that I had to figure it out for other men. So after repeated attempts and failures at trying to really remove myself from the world of the mother but have no context for atonement with the father, uh, you know, I was still struggling. I ended up high as a kite one day sitting in my sauna and I heard a voice. So this is the second voice. I had a dream that brought me to initiation. And then I was sitting in my sauna one day and I heard a voice. I, it, I don't know what it was. I know for a fact that it was a voice and a crazy thing happened. After I heard that voice that day, my sauna, the sparks was flying in it, like started popping off in it and it didn't work. It stopped working. It took me months to figure out how to fix it again. Well, anyway, sitting in the sauna, I heard this voice that said, repent, repent, repent. And I didn't even really even know what that meant. And I even resisted that word repent because it sounded very Christian. And I wasn't ready to be Christian at the time. But that spooked me so much that this was the moment of my Christian conversion. A lot of you guys know that. I was sitting high as a kite in a sauna. And God came and spoke to me and said, repent. And that began my 
long journey of discovering the lost spiritual traditions of the early church. I mean, I dove right into the sacraments. I went and received reconciliation and started going to mass every day and receiving our Lord in the Holy Eucharist, stuff that I hadn't, I didn't know anything about. But I needed to understand what this atonement with the Father was all about. And it was Jesus Christ that was calling me. And so this opened me up to a whole new world and a whole new deep interest that I have in the Christian mystical traditions of the church, a domain of mastery that I'll be learning and practicing probably for the rest of my life. Very fascinating stuff. So I learned about the Desert Fathers and their strict ascetical practice of fasting and mental prayer. I also discovered the writings of St. Augustine, St. Bernard, St. Benedict, and especially St. Teresa of Avila and St. John of the Cross. And you can learn a lot about what they teach in this amazing little book by Ralph Martin called The Fulfillment of All Desire. It's a guidebook for the journey to God based on the wisdom of the saints. And what I learned was that there is a threefold path to holiness. And so... You've got the purgative way, the illuminative way, and the unitive way. So in the spiritual life, the first step is called the purgative way. And this is similar to what I learned about the separation phase in the masculine rites. It's about being freed from sinful vices. And then number two, in the spiritual life, this is referred to as the illuminative way, which was the missing piece from the old pagan rites because it's all about being enlightened by Christ. And then the third phase down at the bottom, the unitive way, is what I discovered is like the atonement with the father phase that I could not understand previously. And it's all about striving for full uniformity with God's will. Amazing. So by combining the outer work of traditional masculine initiation with the inner work of the mystical Christian traditions of the early church, this allowed God's grace to be the animating force in my triumph over my fallen state rather than my own willpower. And I think that's what God was trying to teach me, that my willpower isn't omnipotent. And so by and by, my life was getting better. I was getting back on track. My family was growing closer. We sold our house in the suburbs where things were getting bad. And I moved my family out to our 42 acre homestead here in rural Florida. You see that up top. Uh, I also helped my father retire and move my parents out to the country with us. Like I said, my dad just rolled up. They're getting ready to move in now. <laughs> uh, my children were all baptized and now we attend church every Sunday as a family. My wife and I renewed our vows and we were remarried in the church on our 20th year anniversary and things have never been better between us. Now I'm also more aligned with the man that God has called me to be living in integrity, no more hiding. And most of all, I gain a sense of peace and contentment as I live my life in harmony with my deepest Christian values, which increase my ability to love and to serve others. And so during the pandemic of 2020, while my gym was closed, I decided to launch a new online coaching program instead, exclusively for men called King Transformation, where I taught parts of this framework to over 3,000 of my online students. Now, what you see here is it in its evolved version. Today, it follows the same combination of traditional masculine initiation and the Christian path to holiness that I just showed you with initiation, illumination, and transformation. So the initiation part is all about clean break from the world of the mother, ascetics, fasting, being a tough man, right? Illumination is about enlightening our being enlightened by the mind of Christ and then transformation. Also, like I mentioned earlier for myself, I was missing mentorship and communitas. So I made sure to include this in King Transformation to make it a complete initiation program. And so if you're interested in learning more about traditional masculine initiation, the Christian path to holiness, or you want to go through an initiation process with me and my crew, you can visit elliotholstcom slash king. You could also click the link in the description where you can get a free six parts video series that I put together that will walk you through the whole process. So you don't have to buy anything right away. You just get to watch the videos and learn about this initiation process and what we might be able to do for you. And so finally, if you enjoy this podcast, this video, you'll probably also enjoy the article that goes with it. You can watch the full blog article. You could read it 
at the link down below. And if you know any men that would benefit from hearing the things I've spoken about here in this podcast, I would love if you would share it with them. Just copy the link and, and, and text it to your friend, you know, text it to a group of friends, you know, post it on your social media. Let men know that there is an answer. There is a process. There is hope in our degenerate state. And we need more men to know about this so that we can come out the other end as a strong man that God has called us to be. And so that's it. That's all. That's the end of this show, y'all. I really appreciate you sticking around with me. It was a long show. I'm going to get used to doing more of these because I have a lot that I want to teach and I'm feeling pretty generous with all the things I want to share with you. So stay tuned to the Elliot Hulse podcast. Come on back next. I'm probably going to dive deeper into some of the aspects that we've covered here in this show. In the meantime, you know what to do, bro. Click that link down below. I'm out, yo. Love you. God bless. Done.